Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Flanagan, and I'll be the host for this session. During the session, please make sure to utilize the Q&A button to ask questions of our presenters. You can also view the questions being asked by your fellow attendees, and you can upvote those that you find to be the most valuable. The chat channel can be used to interact with your fellow attendees. However, if you do have questions for the speakers, please put them in the Q&A area. At the end of today's presentation, a four-digit session code will be announced, which you can then use to generate your PACE certificate in CE Organizer. So let's get started. Uh, in, to uh, close out the conference uh, and to introduce our closing keynote speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce ASCLS President-Elect, Maddie Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone has enjoyed and grown from our experience this week. A meeting like this doesn't happen without a year long commitment on the part of volunteer leaders who devote enormous, enormous amounts of personal time to review proposals, set the program and judge posters. And that's just a start. Please join me in thanking the members of the annual meeting steering committee and the abstract and proposal review committee for planning a great meeting. I also want to thank our partners in this endeavor, the Association of Genetic Technologists. AGT and its members bring incredible insight and knowledge to this program from which we all benefit. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge our incredible ASCLS staff, Jim and Melanie, Andrea and Julia, for making the transition to a virtual format and for doing it so well and making it seem so easy. 2020 has been a challenging year so far for everyone, especially those in healthcare and on the front lines. Healthcare professionals have demonstrated their commitment not to not only the health and well being of the public, but also their commitment and support of their colleagues. We work together to achieve best patient outcomes, but we also support one another and we lift each other up when times are tough. Hopefully, we will be face-to-face -face in, in Louisville next summer. And yes, we have heard you, and we will be looking into adding a virtual component to create a hybrid live virtual event. I have another announcement to share with you that means that next year's jam is going to be bigger and better. ASCLS has enjoyed a wonderful relationship with AGT. They have brought important expertise to the educational program, especially this year when molecular testing is the primary way to diagnose COVID-19. Now the two organizations are excited to welcome a third. It is my pleasure to introduce Colonel Michael Stoner. Hi everyone. Colonel Stone is the president of the Society of American Federal Medical Laboratory Scientists, or SAFMILS. With roots back to 1958, SAFMILS' objective is to maintain and enhance high professional standards, improved laboratory policies and technology in support of the healthcare delivery systems of the armed forces, public health services, and veterans administration. Beginning next year, SAFMILS will join ASCLS and AGT as co-sponsors of the joint annual meeting. We are delighted to add our colleagues who care for our men and women in uniform and our veterans to this meeting, not only for their scientific knowledge, but for their deep expertise in leadership. And I call on, Dr. St on Colonel Stoner to make some remarks. Hello, everyone. I don't know if you can uh, see me, but uh, Staff Mills is very excited to join ASCLS, and uh, we're looking forward to the venture ahead. And uh, all our members are are hope to bring leadership and, and uh, whatever we can do to support you. And then we're excited to also learn knowledge from what 
what you experience in your clinical labs, and we can share kind of our military labs and talk about deployments and, and our unique missions as well. So we're excited to join and look forward to hopefully seeing everyone in Louisville next year. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Stoner. We look forward to working with you and the rest of the Staff Mills leadership. The last month and a half has brought sharp focus to the systemic racism that exists in our society. In a statement on racial injustice in action that ASCLS leaders published last month, we accepted the challenge from those crying out in peaceful protest to do our part to address this. Just today, in a major study published in the journal Hypertension, researchers demonstrated a correlation between systemic racism and the increase in incidence of hypertension in a study of 2,000 African-American patients. Today is the first step toward marshalling the talent and skills of clinical laboratory professionals to lead the implementation of solutions to social disparities in healthcare. Today, we get to work. I am pleased to welcome and introduce our closing keynote speaker. Dr. Leonard Egeti is a in general internist and in health services research tenured professor of medicine and chief of the division of general internal medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He is also the director of the Center for Advancing Population Science, Associate Director of Diversity in the Genomic Sciences and Precision Medicine Center, Director of the CTSI KL2 Program, and Director of the CTSI Masters in Clinical Translational Research. As a nationally recognized health disparities researcher, Dr. Egeti's research has focused on developing and testing innovative interventions to reduce and or eliminate health disparities related to race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and geographic location for chronic medical and mental health conditions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Egeti. Thank you for the introduction. I am going to uh, load my slides so that you all can see. And hopefully you can see my slides. And uh, so I'm really uh, glad to have, had, to have a chance to talk to um, a group like this. Uh, and, and really at a time such as this, where we really need a better understanding of some of the issues around health disparities and also social determinants of health. So my talk today is titled, Understanding Health Disparities and Social Determinants of Health, A New Era for Healthcare Professionals. All right, so I have no conflicts of interest. And uh, the learning objectives for this talk are to discuss historical basis for health disparities, discuss sources of health disparities, identify and describe social determinants of health, articulate the impact of social determinants of health on chronic disease outcomes, understand the intersection of social determinants of health with the healthcare system, and discuss potential solutions. And the outline of my talk, uh, I'll, I'll start off with the historical basis for health disparities or what people are calling uh, structural racism. I'll talk about sources of health disparities in clinical encounters. I will go over and uh, the, uh, I'll do an overview of social determinants of health, discuss some of the definitions and terminologies and uh, present some effective strategies to address health disparities. I usually like to start my, as a clinician, um, I've been doing this now for uh, close to 20 years. And I usually like to start off with a discussion about uh, a patient and who really exemplifies uh, some of the things that we actually are going to be discussing today. So this is a patient I saw in clinic, an African-American male, age 61, lives alone, uh, was presenting with asthma, hypertension, and type two diabetes. The patient was not responsive at home. Uh, uh, so the neighbors called 911 and he was hospitalized for diabetes. 
At the time he was uh, seeing, his blood glucose reading was 559, which is really high. And the patient reported not taking medications due to cost and that he stretches them out by skipping doses. Uh, when we talked about uh, testing at home, he said he couldn't afford the test strips. And he does not have transportation, so takes the bus to clinic. And many times he misses his appointment because the bus is late or the bus doesn't show up on time and then his appointment gets canceled. He lives in the inner, in inner city Milwaukee and talks about being afraid to walk around his neighborhood due to gun violence and gang violence. And so he stays mostly indoors, very isolated. And he's unemployed with limited income and, and a limited support network. So I'm gonna use this case uh, to really talk to you about some of the core issues that are tied to disparities and some of the social determinants of health uh, in our healthcare system. So I'll start off with the definition of health disparities. There are two definitions here. One of them is um, really focused on uh, the differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of diseases and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific groups in the United States. So this definition is more of a, of a research definition that allows you to quickly calculate incidence, prevalence, mortality, and compare them across racial groups and gives you a sense of what is going on. But the other definition is really uh, uh, equally important and actually goes to the core of what, uh, what disparities is, and it's the racial or ethnic differences in the quality of healthcare that are not due to access related factors or clinical needs preferences and appropriateness of intervention. And I'm going to use this to explain to you in my next slide, kind of how we frame disparities, what is a disparity and what is not. So this graph is a very important graph uh, or this figure because it, it talks about what are differences, what are disparities and what is discrimination. Uh, uh, and the fundamental point is that we start off with populations with equal access to healthcare. Uh, because at the foundation of, of healthcare is access. So when you have equal access to healthcare and you compare a minority population to a non-minority population, the first question that you ask is if there are differences, those differences may be a function of need, may be a function of preferences, or maybe a function of appropriateness. So for example, if you have two uh, uh, individuals, one from a minority group and one from a non-minority group, and the minority individual has a difference in outcome. It could be that there's a, a need issue. The, uh, the participant or the patient doesn't have a need, and as such, there are differences. For example, we know that with uh, surgical interventions, knee replacement, for example, African-Americans may be less inclined to undergo surgery for knee replacement. So you may find differences in rates of knee replacement that may be due to patient preferences. In that case, we call that a difference. It is not a disparity. Now, the disparity begins to happen when you've excluded appropriateness, need, and patient preferences, and then you still find that those differences exist. At that point, you say there's a disparity. And then when you then begin to identify discrimination that is due to biases or prejudice, stereotyping, or uncertainty, then that in and of itself is then when you talk about discrimination. So there are three terminologies I want to be sure we understand. One is differences which could be due to multi, multiple factors. The next is a disparity, which is usually not good. And then the, the next level is some level of discrimination that may be due to biases, prejudice, stereotyping, or uncertainty. So I always, uh, 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 when I give this talk, I make it very clear that what we're seeing today did not just start today. This is part of a historical societal structure that has led to health disparities. Health disparities did not start overnight. It has been around with us from the time of slavery. So I want to share with you historical information to help you understand that, uh, that the disparities we are seeing today are structural. They've been around for a very long time and that to address them, which is kind of where we are today, to address them, we really need to begin to uh, uh, hit at the root of some of these structural factors that perpetuate racial uh, differences and disparities. So I'm going to, uh, I, I, I have it set up in such a way that I'm going to take you through decades of time to really look at uh, what has happened in our society and how we've gotten to where we are today. So the very first era is the pre-1900s. And at that time, racial inferiority was taught in medical schools. 
they actually had documentation that Blacks and Native Americans were inferior and somehow that their brain size and their skull size was smaller. And as a result, they had lower IQ. This was taught in medical schools. And there were many sociologists and, and, uh, who actually believed that this was true. And this continued to be taught in medical schools for a very long time. So you can imagine that generation who were told that certain groups were inferior and that was what they, what they were trained to believe. And then they had what they called the lexicon of Negro diseases. This was during the time of slavery and something called Struma Africana and they called it the Negro consumption. And for those of us who, are, uh, who know what we know now, this was uh, uh, tuberculosis causing consumption, but it was called a disease of Afri Africans because the assumption was that it was only found in, in, uh, in slaves. Then there was the, what was called cachexia Africana or eating dirt. And this was again uh, called a disease, but when you already understand what we know today, pica essentially is uh, iron deficiency anemia that causes people to eat uh, uh, you know, clay as a way of uh, addressing that. So this was probably what was going on, but it was it, because it was confined to Negroes, it was given a new name. And then the other one I find very interesting is drapetomania, the disease that causes slaves to run away. And I would imagine that no one wanted to be a slave. And if you had a chance, you would run away. So it was interesting that you actually had a name that somehow certain slaves had a proclivity for running away, which is the normal human response to slavery. And then uh, somewhere uh, uh, at some point, a lot of uh, social groups, church groups, religious groups began to advocate for healthcare for the poor. And several hospitals were created in the pre-1800s, uh, 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 including the Philadelphia General Hospital, Charity Hospital in New Orleans, Bellevue in New York, DC General Hospital, and the Baltimore City Hospital. And these hospitals began to provide care for, uh, for slaves and also for the poor. And this is the beginning of the fragmented healthcare that we have right now, and what we call the public and city hospitals, which many of these hospitals ended up becoming city hospitals. And then in 1865 and 1866, there was the Freedmen's Legislation. And this was passed by Congress after the Civil War as a way to provide for, uh, for the Union soldiers, who, uh, for the Black Union soldiers who, uh, who fought for the Union uh, Army. And after that was passed, there was also a move to create medical schools for Blacks and then new hospitals for Blacks. So this began the beginning of a two system or two tiered uh, structure in our society uh, as we know it today. And then from the 1900s to the 1960s, things began to, uh, to change. Uh, racial inferiority was disproved by the 1930s. At that point in time, there was enough data to show that uh, the IQs were not different by race, the brain size was not actually accurate, and so that was disproved. However, the American Medical Association was segregated up until 1968. And so as you can imagine, this was not too long ago, there are still physicians who actually practiced in that era who, when there was still segregation. And then there were compulsory sterilization laws in about 30 states where uh, doctors had a right to actually sterilize African, uh, black women because they, 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 they felt they had, uh, had to control their birth, uh, their, their, uh, their birth rate and their fertility rate. And then a lot of history about unethical experimentation on blacks they were, were what they used to call the, uh, the Mississippi appendectomy, which were hysterectomies performed on black women uh, without their consent, with the idea of sterilizing them and making them not have babies. So the women began to figure out that when you went to the hospital, somehow you lost your ability to have kids. And so that's where a lot of this, the distrust in the African-American community began to actually uh, start. And then obviously everyone knows about this Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which was an experiment that, uh, that, uh, that allowed syphilis to continue in, in black, uh, in a rural uh, um, south, uh, even though there was treatment for it as a way to see the natural history of syphilis. And then there were studies that were conducted at John Hopkins University, University of Chicago, the Medical College of Virginia. There were all experimentation on blacks that were actually not uh, without uh, uh, IRB approval. And then you go to the era of post-World War II, which is where things began to, after, this, uh, after a lot of Blacks were, were, went abroad, they fought in World War II, they came back and they began to ask and demand for healthcare. And many of them were veterans. And so there was crisis health legislation for the poor, and then healthcare was being provided for returning Black veterans. And this is where some of the changes began to happen and where a lot of the VA hospitals began to provide care, uh, disproportionate disproportional care for minorities. 
And then between the 1960s to the 1990s, you had the passage of the Civil Rights Act, which really was supposed to be a, a, a major accomplishment with uh, desegregation of hospitals, the voting rights bill, and when, when Medicare and Medicaid legislation was passed. And uh, for those who know history, this was really fought in, uh, and it was very extensively resisted to actually even set up Medicaid or Medicare and even the hospital desegregation. And then a, a key uh, event that happened was in 1985 when Congress uh, tasked Margaret Heckler to actually pr uh, to put a team together to, uh, and it was called the Task Force on Minority Health. And the goal was to identify the health of the races and to ask the question, are the health of the races equal? And that report uh, uh, came out and said, the health of the races was unequal and it was not acceptable. As a result, uh, Congress mandated the, passage, the setting up of the Office of Minority Health in 1985. And I still have a copy of the Ma Margaret Heckler report. And uh, when I look at the, the data from that report and I look at what we have today, the differences that they found in 1985 is still the same differences we find today. The difference is that the population is just larger. And then from 1990 to 2000, this was where there was renewed interest in racial disparities research. Uh, and at that point in time, there was a need to classify race more accurately. So there was revised standards for the classification of federal data on race and ethnicity in 1997. And so we came up with two uh, categories where you had ethnicity, whether you're Hispanic or Latino or not Hispanic or Latino, and then race, five racial groups, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, uh, uh, non-Hispanic, uh, uh, um, I mean, a Pacific Islander, and then white. And so this uh, began to allow us to actually collect data in a way that was meaningful and allowed people to start seeing differences. And at that time, a lot of the research was focused on descriptive studies, studies that looked at differences in access to care, role of socioeconomic status, differences in receipt of care and differences in quality of care. And as more of these studies got published, people became aware that there were a lot of differences and these differences were really staggering. And then from 2000 to 2010 was when, uh, you know, federal grants began to, uh, to be provided to study health disparity. And this is when really when the work on health disparities really began to take, take off. Uh, so NIH uh, began to set up uh, funding streams, uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, CDC and HRSA all began to fund studies to really look at health disparity. And then in 2002, the Institute of Medicine convened another group very similar to what they did with uh, Margaret Heckler's uh, group. And that group was asked to review the health of the races and to see if there, was still, if there were still differences. And that report concluded that there were differences by race and those differences were unacceptable. Very similar to what Margaret Heckler had found in 1985 and the data was very, very similar and uh, the gaps still remain. And then after that, there was a mandate to, to start establishing a national health disparities report, which was supposed to be published every year. And uh, after a while, people stopped even looking at the data and very little is known about the reports from that, uh, from that report anymore. And then CDC came up with the Healthy People 2010, and the goal was to eliminate uh, disparities in healthcare by race uh, by the year 2010. Obviously that didn't work out, so they decided to extend it to 2020. And I can tell you, uh, we are, we are now in 2020. In 2010, it seemed like 10 years was enough time. We're in 2020 and the gaps are still the same as evidenced by what we're seeing in society today. So again, the overarching goals to eliminate health disparities have not achieved their goal. We're making progress, but we're a long way from where we need to be. And then, uh, uh, as everyone knows, the uh, Affordable Care Act was, uh, was uh, passed into law in 2010, and that was, to, was supposed to provide uh, an additional buffer for the poor, for the marginalized, and to provide some level of free uh, insurance uh, for those who could not afford it. And that uh, made some uh, difference in terms of access, but as you all know, that program is always on the chopping board and there's always conversation about dismantling the Affordable Care Act, regardless of the benefit it actually provides for, uh, for minorities and uh, low income uh, 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 patients. So I just want to now switch gears and talk about how do disparities arise? Because you know, I've given you the historical information, how we, uh, how we got here, and now I just want to talk about how these programs arise. 
So there are three main contributors to disparities in the healthcare environment. One major one is differences in access to healthcare, including preventive and curative services. It's cheaper to prevent disease than to cure disease, but as you all are aware, access to healthcare is a driver of preventive care. And when you're, when you're uninsured, your likelihood of getting access to care is limited. So again, access is a key driver, one of the biggest drivers. The next is differences in the quality of care that you receive within the healthcare system. So even when you have insurance, we talk about insurance and there are different levels of insurance. If you have private insurance versus Medicare versus Medicaid, you, the quality of care you receive is different and that's well documented. If you're uninsured, the quality of care you receive is very limited. So again, there are differences by race that are not just due to access alone. And then the, the next uh, contributor are differences in social, political, economic, and environmental exposures, which result in differences in underlying health. We call this now the built environment. So we know the west and the east side, and people who live on the east side tend to have uh, worse outcomes than those who live on the west side. And it all has to do with where the, line, the railroad tracks used to go through in big, in big cities. There's, we have issues around residential segregation. We have issues around uh, our, uh, job, uh, you know, um, job opportunities that are tied to certain neighborhoods. And very clearly in a lot of the big cities, you actually have areas where as the population of minorities begin to increase, you have a white flight to the, uh, to the suburbs. And all of these factors drive some of the healthcare that we see and some of the disparities that we continue to see today. So I'm just gonna use an example. This is um, a, a pictograph that shows uh, all the uncertainty that goes into healthcare. Uh, because when we talk to physicians and clinicians, uh, people say, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not prejudiced. I don't have, you know, I'm not racist. I'm not, I do not discriminate. But when you look at how decisions are made, it's amazing how we even have the ability to even have fair decisions at all. So a patient comes to you, based on your interaction with that patient in terms of their level of education, your own uh, biases already, the, the, how comfortable they are talking to you, you get a medical history. And in that medical history, you've already created a story that is based on your interpretation of the individual's story. Then you, you conduct your physical exam and you run your diagnostic test. And now you have what is supposed to be, when I was in medical school, we're told that 90% of the data came from the history and 10% came from, from the, uh, uh, from the um, labs. Well, what you find is that when you actually have limited history taking, what you then have is you have this subjectivity in terms of diagnostic alternatives. And then built into that are your own conscious and unconscious bias, your stereotyping, the, your perception of the patient, how does this patient, can they afford to pay? Uh, are they homeless? Uh, you know, do you have an issue? Are they obese? Uh, do you blame them for the disease that they actually have? And then you have all of these social and economic and cultural influences that guide that interpretation. And then finally, you get to the point of intervention. What do I do for this individual? And that's where a lot of the uncertainty comes in, but then prejudice comes in, you know, conscious and unconscious. We make decisions about who gets certain uh, care and who doesn't. I remember a, uh, a case where I was, I called a surgeon to, uh, to get um, a guy's foot amputated. It was an African-American male in his 60s with type two diabetes and with gangrene. And I said, you know, uh, uh, could you amputate this guy's toe so that we can actually save his foot? And the surgeon looked me in the face and said, this man is going to die anyway. I don't think it's worthwhile. I'm not going to do the surgery. I was, I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe this. And I said, are you telling me that you're going to let this man die? He said, well, it's a waste of resources. I don't think this surgery is worthwhile. And the man died about seven days later from sepsis and nothing happened about it. I've seen cases like this over and over again where people make decisions and they justify it by saying, we're trying to save resources. We're trying to ration care. But at the end of the day, the ration is always based on uh, decisions that are made based on your perception of the relative value of that individual's life. So they are racially disparate clinical decisions are made every day in a healthcare system. Some of them are unintentional. Some of them are decisions that are made because people just don't have enough information. But there are things that are tied to prejudice, tied to stereotyping and how we view patients and the value we assign to certain patients, whether by race, by gender, by age, and all of those factors impact uh, the outcomes in the healthcare system. 
So I, 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 this is a quote from, uh, that I really think is important for us to understand the legacy of distrust, that history combines with contemporary social experiences to further cement the perspective of mistrust in the psyche of the African-American community. They wonder if they'll be given equal treatment by a healthcare system that treated blacks as guinea pigs not so long ago. This reality, justified or not, is ever present with African-Americans. So this is just a piece of the issue. People do not trust the healthcare system. We have patients who come to the, uh, to the, to the clinical encounter who have experienced discrimination their whole life and they're asking themselves the question, how can I trust what this physician is telling me is true? How do I know that I'm gonna get good care? And these are the factors that drive some of the differences that we see uh, in terms of how people receive treatment. And I can tell you a lot of African-Americans and even uh, Hispanics and Latinos now do not believe that any of the clinical trials that are being done, any of the studies that are being done really will benefit them. At the end of the day, the perception is when this is all said and done, we are just being used as guinea pigs. When the treatment comes up, I can't afford it. It will not be offered to me and I may not benefit from it. So these are core issues that are being highlighted now with uh, the recent set of events in our, our society. And so this is a cartoon that I think is really uh, important uh, because it talks about racial prejudice bug, or it talks about the idea that uh, most people do not realize that there's something going on until someone actually begins to point it out. And I think the series of events uh, that just happened uh, with George Floyd has brought to our consciousness the fact that all of these structural issues have existed. They didn't start yesterday. They didn't start uh, you know, uh, last week or last month. They've been around since the time of slavery. We've tolerated them. It has become part of our way of functioning. We've ignored them. We've not talked about them. We've avoided discussing them just so that it will go away. And now we are forced to talk about them because this is real. And these are lives that are being impacted by a lot of the decisions that are tied to racial prejudice, bias, and stereotyping. So I want to go ahead and talk about some of the other challenges that we see as we talk about, because you know, right now, uh, you know, everyone is talking about, I hear people saying things like, we hear you, we see you, we understand what is going on. And when it's all said and done, the real issue is what is going to happen? What is going to change? Is this going to be another one of those demonstrations? It passes away, it fizzles away, and it becomes just another, you know, just another, another point in history, as opposed to really taking a step back and asking what can we do to address these structural issues. So here are four areas I want to touch on that are challenges right now, but also opportunities as we think about this. The first is affordability and universal access to care. One of the things that's very clear is that access to care is important. That people who have insurance do better than those who do not have insurance. So that's not questionable. The real issue is that Insurance coverage, income, and community uh, resources differ by race and ethnicity. We need to find a way to equalize those differences. And then when people talk about universal access, they actually assume that universal access will result in equity. It depends on what that universal access allows you to afford. So if, you, if they gave you one, if they give one group private insurance and they give another group Medicaid, those two groups are not equal. So when we talk about universal access, we're talking about universal access to similar levels of coverage. And then uh, the next thing that is very uh, popular right now is genomic, uh, uh, genomics and precision medicine. And everyone talks about you know, personalized medicine, but what people don't realize is that a lot of the studies that are being done are done in white populations. There are less than 8% of those genom uh, genomic uh, uh, studies actually have enough data on African-Americans or even uh, 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 Hispanics and Latinos. What does that mean? That policies are needed to ensure inclusion of racial and ethnic groups in collection and use of genetic information. But there's also the need to attend to the impact of socioeconomic status and different levels of knowledge about risk and benefit. We've done studies where we've actually asked uh, African-Americans, how comfortable are you with genetic testing? And most people will tell you no. I don't know what they're going to do with that information. And once they have that data, I don't know what they're going to do with it, which then limits people's willingness to participate in studies that will actually benefit them as we find treatment. And more importantly, because there's inadequate data on African-Americans and, 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 and genes uh, from the uh, African continent, you are not able to actually create personalized medicine for that group. The next area is uh, measurement of race. 
I hear a lot of people say, why do we even measure race? Why do we, uh, you know, I don't, I'm, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't pay attention to race. It doesn't really matter. The answer is it does. It does because we need complete and reliable information and consistency in collection and definitions of race. Without the data, how do we know how we're doing? The reason why Margaret Heckler report and the uh, Institute of Medicine report were, were able to uh, look at differences was because we had good measurement of race. And many groups now are beginning to say, we don't collect uh, information on race because they don't want to report differences by race. And then we need to recognize that the conceptualization of ethnicity differs based on, on time spent in the United States and this should be taken into account. So we need to pay attention to, it's not just about race, it's about ethnicity and how you define that. We're beginning to see people who are uh, uh, multiracial. And so I, at the end of the day, we need to find ways of being able to capture the lived experiences of individuals based on whatever race they define themselves at. The next uh, area that's a challenge, but also an opportunity is workforce diversity. There's consistent report of low diversity in the healthcare workforce. When we look at data across different groups, roughly less than 10% of the physician workforce is made up of uh, African-Americans, Hispanic or, or Native Americans, or American Indian. What does that mean? We are not reflecting the nature of our population. If our society is uh, you know, going to eventually become a majority minority uh, population, we don't have enough minorities who are actually in the health uh, care workforce. I would imagine that this is not just physician workforce. This is all levels of healthcare workforce, all the way to nurses, to, uh, to, uh, to technicians, to individuals who work in different aspects of healthcare. And so efforts need to be made to increase the number of minorities entering the pipeline. And what this means is that this pipeline starts very early on. It's not, at, it's not in college, it's not even in high school. Some of these things begin to happen early on in middle school. And that's where a lot of attention, and I'm hoping that uh, the audience who's listening to this, you're asking yourself in your area of influence, how can I diversify my workforce? How can I begin to add to this pipeline? Can I begin to create mentoring programs? Can I create programs that allow middle school students to kind of observe what I do as a way to allow them to actually gain interest and see themselves as being able to do uh, what you do? So these are all things that are critical if we really want to address some of the issues we see today. And now I'm going to just switch gears and talk about social determinants of health because uh, as, as we have done a lot of work in this area, we're beginning to realize there's intersection of race and social determinants. And some of the things that, are, uh, you know, we, we always say that poverty and race are highly correlated. Minorities are more likely to be poor. And so when you look at some of these social determinants, they are more likely to have impact on minority groups. I'm going to share some uh, information about social determinants of health. So what, I, what is the definition? This is the standard definition by the World Health Organization that the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels. So again, this is kind of where you live, who you are, where you grow up, so you can't escape from it. It is your environment, it is your school system, it is your, your, uh, your health system. It is literally all your resources that are available to you. These are some of the social determinants. So this is a, uh, the two um, conceptual frameworks I would like to share with you very quickly, not to go into all the technical components of this, but just understanding that as an individual, you are surrounded by your lifestyle factors but then your social and community networks, and then this larger macro environment that includes agriculture and food production, education, work environment, living and working conditions, unemployment, water and sanitation, healthcare services and housing. And so in the healthcare field, we're always focused on the individual and we don't pay attention to that people live somewhere. They don't come to the clinic or they don't come to the hospital from nowhere. They actually live, they are part of a society and that society has influences on them. And these are some of the social determinants that impact health and health outcomes. The next uh, uh, framework is what we tend to use because it's really, uh, this is the uh, CDC framework and it's very simplistic, but it's actually very effective in trying to portray what social determinants are. So you start off with economic stability. Then you talk about education social and community context, health and healthcare, and the neighborhood and built environment. And I'm going to share with you the evidence that we have for each of these areas and how they impact health. So if we start with economic stability as a social determinant of health, 
Economic stability includes areas such as housing, employment, food security, and poverty. There's overwhelming evidence that housing quality is associated with chronic disease, infectious disease, injury, and mental health. We know that housing is tied to asthma uh, prevalence and incidence. We know that housing is tied to uh, disease, uh, infectious disease uh, um, uh, you know, uh, prevalence, but also employment. Employment is associated with mental and physical health. And the, those who have employment tend to have more resources, but they also tend to have, there's something about going to work that actually Im impacts your mental and physical health. And unemployment increases your risk for food insecurity and poverty, uh, which compounds existing health challenges. Then education as a social determinant of health. Education includes areas such as health literacy, completing high school and early development. And there's very strong evidence that literacy is associated with increased low literacy level, is associated with increased hospitalization, poor screening, preventive behavior, and chronic disease. And then that having a high school education actually has an impact, just having a high school education has an impact with, with your risk of, have, of good health outcomes. And the more education you have, the better your health outcomes. This has been well established. And that early development, access to your, your childhood environment, what we call, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, life, life cost socioeconomic status, your, 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 where you grew up, your education, your housing, your family, all of those things have impact on health and health outcomes. And then the social and community are social determinants of health. And these include areas such as social cohesion and discrimination. And now if you actually think about uh, some of these areas, this includes policing, it includes incarceration, it includes all of those factors that are tied to your community, the level of uh, you know, how you're perceived in your community and the, and the role that it has. We know that social cohesion is related to lower risk of uh, mortality. So social isolation is bad for your health and communities that are disconnected tend to have poorer outcomes. The same thing with discrimination. When you perceive this, that you're discriminated, exposure to discrimination, what some people call microaggression, others called uh, internalized racism. All of those factors are associated with chronic disease. There's very strong evidence that links that to uh, chronic stress, to mental health, poor mental health, uh, higher uh, uh, diabetes prevalence and higher risk of hypertension. So again, all of these factors impact health and health outcomes. And then health and access are social determinants. And so health and access includes areas such as access to healthcare, access to primary care and health insurance coverage. And like I've said already, access to health services is a key driver of health outcomes. So if you don't have insurance, you, can't, you don't have a primary care provider, you can't access preventive care services, you really at risk for having very poor outcomes. Then I, I just want to talk briefly about the built environment, and this is what we call neighborhood and built environment. This includes issues such as access to transportation, healthy foods, neighborhood crime, and violence. When you live in the inner city, where the nearest grocery store is probably two to four miles away. You can't get there. You have no access to healthy food. You, you, because of crime, you can't actually exercise in your, in your neighborhood. No green space. You can't get access to transportation. Your bus is not regular. All of these things uh, have negative outcomes on your health. And that when you have access to healthy food, it actually improves your eating habits and also prevents uh, uh, disease. Same thing with crime and violence, even the nature of your neighborhood, the, the, the stress that comes from having gun violence in your neighborhood really is very, very challenging. We're doing some focus groups uh, in inner city Milwaukee, and we actually were talking to uh, you know, community members and this veteran got up and he said, he said, you know, I was in Afghanistan. I spent time on service in Afghanistan. And he said, living in inner city Milwaukee is like being in a war zone. He said, the difference is that at least when I was in Afghanistan, I got hazard pay. When I live in Milwaukee, I don't have hazard pay. I live every day. I'm not sure if a, a bullet will go through my wall. So these are the things that people live day in, day out with. And these are some of the underlying drivers of poor health, health outcomes in many of these uh, societies and communities. So I am going to then move on. As you can tell, I'm going through a lot of this uh, 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 just to kind of give high level information about some of these issues. But I really think it's important for us to understand the terminology because we, people throw the words around, you know, social determinants, just like people uh, uh, are now using the word structural racism without understanding what does it really mean. So I just want to share some perspective on what do we mean by social determinants and what are some of the terminology that are out there. 
So one is social risk factors. Social risk factors refer to adverse factors such as low education, housing instability that, are, that occur at the individual level. So use of social risk factors to specify adverse factors that impact health and not uh, make it clear that social determinants are not negative or positive. Social determinants are just what they are. They're the things around us. So it is when you begin to talk about social risk, you actually say, what are those factors, those social determinants that are negative or have negative impact on health? Then we talk about behavioral risk factors. Behavioral risk factors are also distinguished from social risk factors. The, the behavioral risk factors include behaviors that place health at risk. Things like smoking, substance use, lack of physical activity and poor diet. Behavioral risk factors can be shaped by social factors. And then social needs. Social needs are distinct from social factors because they are based in preference and priorities. Social needs are foundational for prioritizing interventions. So when health systems are talking about social determinants, what they really should be talking about are social needs because social needs are the forefront of a patient's lived experience. That's what they are dealing with. That's what they need. So it may be, uh, uh, so when you create a social risk screening tool, you can then use it to identify social risk like food insecurity. However, this may not be a priority for the patient. So some patients, their priority may be transportation. Their priority may be housing. They need a, a different place. Their priority may actually be uh, the social isolation. So you need to actually tailor the intervention to match what the individual identifies as a need. And that's why social needs uh, really is, uh, are important factors to consider. And then social prescribing. Social prescribing is a terminology that's used in the UK to identify the social needs of a patient within a clinical encounter. The problem with this definition is that social needs, social risk, and behavioral risk do not have prescriptions. You can't prescribe, you can't uh, provide a prescription uh, you know, for Im or immediate solution that can be given to a patient in a clinical encounter. It requires partnership. So many of these things make it, uh, when you use the word social prescribing, they simplify the problem as if just giving someone a voucher to, uh, to um, you know, to uh, a food pantry just solves their years of, of, of structural issues in their home. So I think it's more thoughtful and well uh, thought through strategies that's gonna get us to the point where we actually solve this problem. And then the last uh, area of this is social needs informed care. So social needs informed care includes activities that involve modifications to traditional medical care to account for patient social circumstances. So this includes things like providing transportation to appointments, having translators for patients with language barriers and creating opportunities for people to actually have education in a way they can actually benefit. So many times we provide education and assume everyone can read. We actually don't pay attention to literacy levels. We don't pay attention to cultural uh, differences in how people learn. And all of these things are part of that uh, uh, social needs informed care. So now I just want to close by going into strategies to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in health. I want to start off by saying there is no magic bullet. If there was a, ma if there were a magic bullet, we should have had it a long time ago. Like I said, this is a uh, structural issue it goes all the way from the time of slavery to where we are today, and it's gonna require a collective and uh, a strategy to address it, but each person can start somewhere. So I'm gonna share with you some things that are known to be effective. Uh, and uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is that uh, if you're going to address uh, how disparities reduction, there are two quotes from a paper that I actually think are important. One is a need to move beyond the general recognition that unacceptable disparities exist to the creation of structures and mechanisms to maximize the chance that equity issues will be addressed. Not just addressing it, but being meaningfully addressed. And then the next point is that for interventions to be successful, they must be individualized for the specific organizational, historical, cultural, and geographic context of the patient population. We can't just have one size fits all. We need to understand what is going on why people do what they do, where they are, and how can we meet them where they are to address some of these issues. So a couple of areas that are very, where there's very good evidence. One is cultural and linguistic competence. So at the healthcare organization level, the ability of, a healthcare, of healthcare providers and healthcare organizations to understand and respond effectively to the cultural and linguistic needs brought by patients to the healthcare encounter. So this means that where uh, healthcare systems need to ask themselves, what are some of these cultural factors? 
How do people uh, want to receive care? What is important to them? And then how do they communicate? What is the best way to communicate with them? And how do I provide communication in a way that's meaningful to them? And then at the individual patient and provider level, the ability of individuals to establish effective interpersonal and working relationships that supersede cultural differences. So one of the things I tell people is that if we, even if we train as based on the population of, of the United States, even if we train as many black physicians, African-American physicians as we can, we don't have enough to meet the needs of the minority population. We don't have the need to meet the needs of the Latino population. So what that means is that we have to train people across cultures to provide care to people of different cultures and be able to create this level of cultural understanding that allows people to provide care in a meaningful way. And so what are some of the comp uh, components of cultural competence? One starts with language needs. So interpreter services, and then linguistic competency in educational materials. What do you provide to patients? So many times we tell people you're, you're doing genetic testing. What, 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 what is the level of understanding? How do we provide that information to participants? How do we tell them about the lab tests they're about to have? What does that? We have patients right now, we're doing some study on COVID-19. And the patient said to me, so you mean you put something in my nose and you tell me I have COVID? I don't believe it. So I had to go through and say to myself, wow, how are we providing education about COVID? And maybe this is why people are not willing to get tested because they just don't understand what, what it means. And we need to find ways to get that educational material at the level where the individual is. The next thing is institutional accommodation. Many times people don't realize that minorities and low-income participants, actually, when they take time off from work, it costs money. So when you order that lab test and you tell someone to go to the lab and the lab is closed, they've already taken time from work for your appointment that is already on paid time, and then they now have to take additional time, then the hours are not convenient. Our hours are very convenient for people who work a nine to five job and who have the ability to take time off and have paid time off. When you don't have sick leave, you don't have paid time off, location, hours of operation actually matters. That's why many of these individuals use the emergency department because they just know that when you go to the emergency department, it's always open, as opposed to trying to get an appointment at from nine to five when there's no when they can't get off from work. Then the diversity training for staff, being able to understand uh, people's culture, how they talk, how they connect, how they look, how they present to the clinic, what they wear, and being comfortable. Even the hairstyle, people walking into your clinic, how they look is actually important. And understanding that this is who they are and their culture and being accepting. Then cultural homo or homophily in provision of care. What this means is using staff with similar cultural background. When you walk into a, a, a clinic, people want to see people that look like them. They want that, uh, you know, that in that lab, they want to see someone at least looks like them. They want a nurse that looks like them. They want to see a doctor that looks like them. Now you can't get that level of always having uh, people that look exactly like you, but you want to look around you and say, okay, I see people that look like me. So. That's important. The next is inclusion of family in care, being able to get people to actually talk about their family. Many, many of the cultures, African-Americans, Latino cultures, the family is very important. And so using, leveraging the family relationships to provide information is very critical. And then the use of community health workers. There's very strong evidence now that community health workers make a difference. How do we leverage them? How do we involve them in healthcare? How do we use them to provide education? We are even looking into using them to address mixed appointments because we can actually get people to actually participate and engage in care because of someone they trust who's from their community who can talk to them. And then cross-cultural education. So this is also very important. This is tied to uh, you know, providing knowledge about cross-cultural issues, talking about incidence and prevalence of disease among groups, and looking at historical factors that may shape behavior. So some of the things I've shared already talk about history. Without understanding the history of how we got here, you really can't get people to actually bring about meaningful change. And a lot of the curriculum right now does not pay enough attention to some of these issues. And then we need to look at attitudes. So increase awareness of the impact of sociocultural factors on patients' health behavior, reflections on culture, racism, classism, sexism, all of the things that we're talking about today, we now use the word structural racism, but these are things that are built into the fabric of our society and people need to understand that. And then having empathy and respect in the medical encounter and recognizing that at the end of the day, the individual is the most knowledgeable about themselves. They know what they want and being able to work with them to achieve a common goal. And then um, the recruitment and retention of a diverse workforce. I've already talked about this, but I really think 
we need to think about how do we recruit? People tend to recruit people that look like them. Your network, your social network is based off of people who look like you. So if you are the director of a program, you're the one who is hiring, who do you hire? How do you find people who are diverse? How do you get to make uh, uh, diversity a, a priority for recruitment? And how do you find individuals from diverse backgrounds to bring into your organization? If you hire based on your social network, I hear people saying things like, well, I couldn't find competent minorities. And my answer is that's actually not accurate. There are many competent minorities out there. You just don't know how to find them. You're not putting the effort in to create a diverse uh, pipeline. And then broaden your referral base so that you cannot, you do not replicate homogeneity identifying people who can actually help you recruit. There are recruitment firms right now that different strategies to reach out to minority groups where you can actually get diversity. And then thinking about appropriate mix of your selection and screening techniques, but also who is on your interview panel? How diverse is your interview panel? Are you actually having people from other groups who can weigh in and say, Let me, let's talk about other issues that are different from the standard questions you ask during the interview? Because many of the interview questions are based on a, the predominant race, the predominant culture, how you talk, how you engage, how you communicate without paying attention to the diversity in communication and how people actually interact. So I'm gonna go back and revisit my, uh, the case. And so, and, I, in, uh, and I've highlighted in, in, uh, in, in red, the issues that are tied to race and social determinants. So this is an African-American male, he's older, he lives alone. So there's already social isolation, there's race there. Then he is not taking his medications due to cost, poverty, low socioeconomic status, cannot afford test trips, and then doesn't have transportation. So again, he has a social need, no transportation, lives in the inner city, the built environment, is afraid to walk around his neighborhood due to gun violence. So again, the built environment, and then he's unemployed with limited income and support network, financial limitations, poverty, all of these factors are driving the disease that the individual has, but also driving the poor outcomes. When you have a glucose of 559, it is not a good place to be. And so this, this individual, we, you know, we, we, we treated him, we got him better, we sent him more, we actually sent some uh, community workers to help address some of the social issues. But this is uh, a lot of patients we see day to day. And when you start thinking about this, until we start putting structures in place, these types of patients will continue to go through our process and many of them will die because we don't have systems in place to address their healthcare needs. So I'll close by saying that equity is achievable. And, I, and I'll quote from John F. Kennedy that one person can make a difference and everyone should try. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Agaty, I we just have one minute left and um, that was an excellent presentation and judging by the comments, um, people are um, appropriately outraged. But let me just ask you this one question. The historical oversight you are providing that fuels disparities and your mention of distrust is so important. How can medical laboratory professionals find ways to work with medical and public health partners to build trust and help increase the prevalence of important screening tests that we know help fuel primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention efforts? Oh, this is, this is really important because I think it's even more important now with COVID-19 and trying to get people to get screened. So I think the first part of this uh, question is uh, that partnership. The awareness that um, you know, the medical laboratory technicians and professionals are the individuals who actually are doing the blood draws. They're actually doing the, the uh, having the conversation. So being able to have materials you can actually share with individuals that is low literacy, culturally appropriate, that individuals can take with them. Uh, and also paying attention to the conversation you have in terms of how you communicate. And that if you actually have conversations with individuals that really, uh, they feel comfortable with you and they feel like uh, the information you give them, you're giving them is unbiased and, and, and um, non-judgmental, many of them will receive it. We've done studies where we've actually asked participants, what does it take to build trust? And the response is, we just want someone that cares, someone that actually hears me, that listens to me. So sometimes just having uh, a, being able to listen, what is the individual expressing? What are the concerns? Why are they uncomfortable with the test? That may actually help in terms of doing that. But I think it's the coordination of of, of care and providing materials that people can use 
in terms of knowledge and understanding to help them uh, address this issue. But obviously, this is just one part of it. There are bigger uh, structural issues around distrust that would need to be addressed, but this is a starting point. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Getty. Thank you all for your participation in this session. Uh, it's interesting to watch the chat go by. Uh, it's a real-time demonstration of the importance of diverse groups. Um, I don't know if you all were noticing, but more or less you all planned a short symposium on this subject. You've got uh, topics, you've got approaches to panels, you've got uh, all sorts of wonderful ideas that we're capturing and we'll be sharing with the board as potentially the next step in the work that we're doing. Um, so thank you, Dr. Getty, very much for this um, incredible, uh, eye-opening, um, just masterful session. Um, I, I'm sure you weren't reading the comments, but um, they're, they're very appreciative of, of the work that you shared with us today. For those of you claiming CE credit, the CE organizer code for this session is 5798. That is 5798. Thank you all for coming to our first virtual uh, joint annual meeting. We look forward to potentially seeing all of you in Louisville next year. Have a wonderful evening uh, and, and enjoy your travel home, I guess. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.